so we welcome you to the nonprofit show. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Julia. It's really an exciting thing. I have tremendous respect for anyone who's ever written a book. And so we're going to talk about that and dig into this um, before we get going. I want to make sure that we welcome folks from all over the world that are joining us today. Um, normally, you would see us coming to you from our studio, and we would have a, a lot of other different things going on. But um, this is kind of an exciting time. If you just joined us again, I'm Julia Patrick with the American Nonprofit Academy. Um, my co-host, Jarrett Ransom, will be back on with us tomorrow. We want to make sure we thank all of our presenting sponsors, Bloomerang Fundraising Academy at National University, your part-time controller, Be Generous, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and then the Nonprofit Nerd. Whew. Okay. All right. So I got to say, one cause has put you into the philanthropic spotlight. First, before we get into your book, talk to us about what your work and your leadership at One Cause looks like and how you've navigated to writing. So uh, again, thank you for having me today, Julia. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here and to be in front of all of your um, supporters. So I'm the CEO of One Cause, and we make and sell digital fundraising solutions for nonprofits. We have about 6,000 active fundraising subscriptions right now, and we're across the country. And since our founding in 2008, we've helped raise about $4 billion for our customers on the fundraising platform. So we're really humbled by that. We're really excited by that. We've been going at it for 14 years, and wow. I have been at the helm as CEO uh, for eight years now. After about a 30-year career in executive leadership role, I've done uh, technology, finance, venture capital, and I really answered a call. I answered a call to do more, to, to pursue mission, to pursue purpose, and that's really what brought me to one cause. We were called, we were called BidPal back in the day. Uh, when I first joined, but we've been we've been at it for um, again I've been at it for eight years, and then um, we found ourselves in the middle of this uh, global pandemic, yeah. and 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 thank you for asking about how did I become an author because what I would call myself is an accidental author. <laughs> I didn't set out to write this book. The book that we we didn't set out to 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 do this at, at the onset. We mm -hmm. set out to basically, or I set out to create an ongoing update for my team and, and a communication, an open communication of how we were doing as a company, how we were helping our nonprofit customers get back on their feet after that horrible March 14th weekend where we had you know 200 planned events uh, that we were gonna support, which went to zero in the same week after that. And then we had to go back with, then we had to go to work, essentially getting everyone uh, converted over to virtual and online and, and really changing the game on us. You know, I'm fascinated that of all the words that you could have chosen to entitle your book, you use the word fearless. And I've got to ask you about that because I've been so intrigued um, by your story. And I love that you use the phrase, you're an accidental author. Yeah. Um, because you're not accidental as a leader by any stretch of the imagination. So marry those two words for me, accidental and fearless. How did you come up with that? So the word fearless, we've been using for years in a hashtag fearless fundraisers in connection with our annual raise conference. Okay. And so we've really been, um, again, using that word year after year to describe just being fearless and going out there and just and getting it done and making it happen. Well, again, the pandemic created this this uh, an, another this huge obstacle in our way, right? right? And the last thing that we could do was show fear. And 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 so and so the rallying call here was let's be fearless about how we go about it. And, and, and Julia, it's about our daily lives. It was about because we were balancing uh, kids staying home from school. We were balancing spouses working in din on dining room tables and in on, on, on kitchen tables. We were in a situation where we had just never uh, experienced that before. And so, again, being fearless is about, you know, what I will use is another word that that CEOs don't like to use a lot. 
and that's vulnerability or being vulnerable, <laughs> and, right? Because, but but for me, being vulnerable was to say I don't have all the answers, but you can be vulnerable and still be fearless. You can be vulnerable and and create a vision and, and say, listen, I don't have all the answers. We're going to figure this out together. And I said something about CEOs and CEOs, we use code words. And the code words that we were using at the time were things like, there's no playbook for this, right? How many times did you hear that? Or, this <laughs> How is, many times did I say that? <laughs> I know. <laughs> or this is truly <laughs> unprecedented. Yeah. What, what we meant was, wow, we've never seen this before. We really don't know exactly what to do, but we're just going to create a plan and we're going to keep going and we're going to keep uh, keep, keep our, our, our team going with the vision that we can paint for them. And again, when I say that, it's not, it's not, it's not, and I use the word hope here a lot too, Julia. And so it's hope, but it's not a false hope that's based on just some sort of wish. Right. It's hope based on a vision for the future and a plan and action towards that plan that really can, can kind of get behind the promise of hope. You know, Steve, I'm, I'm fascinated by, by the direction of this conversation. And it also makes me think that, and I, I'd love to get your feedback on this. It probably is a path of leadership that you have imbued your teams with prior. I mean, a lot of the things that I'm, I'm hearing you say, I suspect this is how you were already leading. Would you agree with that? Or did you see a change or did you just have to kind of articulate it in a little bit of a different way? I think, I think you're right. I think you're spot on with the articulation. So it was the way that we were leading or that I was leading mm -hmm. in any event. Mm -hmm. And the weekly updates really gave me the platform for communicating that and really clarifying that as a message. And everyone who works for me knows that one of the one of the, my quotes about leadership that I love is a good leader is one who inspires others to lead. And yeah. so from my perspective, and, and as I communicate to my team, everyone is a leader of your own domain, of your own responsibilities. And so you can be a leader at your home. You can be a leader in your department. You don't have to be the CEO to be a leader. And so that was my philosophy. And to your point, the, the weekly update, updates gave me the, the platform for communicating that on, on a broader scale. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I tell you, you know, I, I, I'm thinking back to those days um, in the very beginning when I made this commitment and I made this commitment of weekly transparent communication to the team for our way back from the pandemic. And it was, I didn't realize it at the time. I didn't know we were going to go two, two years. <laughs> if someone would have said, hey, Steve, you have to commit for two years to a weekly update. I probably would have said, no way. <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> well, Steve, I'll tell you, I committed to do the nonprofit show for two weeks because <laughs> I was the brain surgeon that said, how long can a pandemic right. go on? Come on. Right. Well, we're, you know, modern time. We live in the scientific age. We're going to knock this, you know. And uh, yeah, and now we are in almost three years with the nonprofit show because literally yes. that daily communication that we chose to do, very similar to what you you were saying, we, you know, we spent a lot of time on camera saying, we don't know the path forward, but we know our work has to continue. We know our work is important and we have to to rally the troops and pull together in a, in a fearless manner. And I think yes. it's fascinating. Now, let me ask you about another word that you use. Um, and this is actually in the subtitle of your new book, fearless looking our leadership, yeah, leadership lessons at the crossroads. Talk to me about what the crossroads are and were for you, because I suspect that can be a little different for everyone. And it maybe is. Not. And <laughs> and, and, you know, so so literal definition crossroads, a decision point or, you know, a, a point at which you have to make a decision to go one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And and I want to touch on an earlier point that you made, because it, it was really one of the driving forces for one cause as well. Mm -hmm. We realized that 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 our continued existence and 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 thriving was just was not just about one cause. It was about the thousands of nonprofits and the causes that they that they were were um, uh, uh, leading. And so this was just 
our our success was so much was was important to us, but it was so important for the broader uh, nonprofit world. I mean, we were responsible for 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 helping about five hundred million dollars of fundraising happen in that twelve month period from March to March. And, and it was so important for us to continue. And so, so Crossroads, it never was a decision to say, oh, you know, are we really going to focus on, on growing and surviving or are we just going to pack up in our tent and go home? That was never the, the Crossroads, but we, we hit a Crossroads every day. Right. And, and our customers were hitting a Crossroads every day and their donors were hitting a Crossroads every day. Do I give? Do I not give? Do I fully support? Do I not fully support? Do, do we have that event? Do we not have the event? If we're not going to have the event, do we do virtual? Do we do online? Do we just do outreach through our CRM? Like every single day, there was a crossroads and a, a decision that had to be made about how do we keep these, these, these organizations and their mission moving forward. Right. You know, it's such an interesting thing, Steve, because I think um, in the beginning of the pandemic, and I think it's such an interesting aspect to, to discuss, and that is that that sense of things are bad. We're gonna we're gonna pump the brakes, and we're gonna, you know, to your to your uh, description, you know, CEO speak for we're gonna stop or pause, or mm -hmm. we're gonna lean in and we're gonna push hard. And and it seems to me, and I'd love to get your feedback on this, that we saw two different approaches with leadership. And I would argue that it's based on fear, you know, the fear of pushing forward and failing, taking risks or, or stepping back and saying, yeah, we just need to kind of lay low. Everybody take a couple of weeks off and then we'll regather. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that. Now that you have, you know, several, several years to look at wow. that. Yeah. So as I think, as I think about that, there was not a moment where we thought of pausing. There was not a moment where we thought of taking a step back. Mm -hmm. Every moment was driving forward, coming up with new solutions. And in fact, a couple of weeks into the pandemic, we had an executive team meeting and we decided to take all of the technical investment that we were making in a new product and, and, and channeling it towards creating a new product specifically for the pandemic. We called it the Virtual Event Center. And by September, we were releasing the virtual event center that was custom made for virtual fundraising. So we made that absolutely positive decision to move forward and create a, a purpose-built solution for virtual fundraising. And so, and again, we, we felt the same. And, and that's why I love the book. That's why I love how the book turned out. The book is, uh, my name is on the front and <laughs> I'm an author, Okay. <laughs> But the book is not about Steve Johns. It's not, and it's about one cause, but it's about one cause and our customers and their donors rallying together, getting through these unprecedented times. And I'm going to use that word. I know that everyone doesn't like to use that word. Uh, getting through these unprecedented times uh, mm -hmm. together. And that's the story that unfolds at, in, in Fearless. And that's why when, when we started to read manuscript after manuscript, I, and I, I started to really feel like this is a book that's coming together. It's telling a story that we can see all we can see each other in. And it's it's a story of how we su survived. But I will also add that it's a story for day to day crisis. It's a day. It's a story for day to day management of change and, and being resilient and, and overcoming adversity and managing time and being mindful. All of these things that we need when when when, it, when just when we get up in the morning, not not even having to deal with a global pandemic. Right. You know, as um, I come to you today from Phoenix, Arizona, and, and yes. again, I say thanks to Creighton Medical University who's allowed me to broadcast uh, from their amazing new facility. Um, I'm here today to uh, be part of an amazing and fearless gift from the Rob and Melanie Walton Foundation that will um, actually endow the CEO position of St. Vincent de Paul which is a, a, a human welfare organization, the largest on the planet based here in my community that feeds, house and heals through a medical uh, center and, and amazing work in the fifth largest city in America. And I, I'm, I'm so inspired by your book and I'm so inspired by um, the conversation because this is what it's all about. It is about fearless leadership and taking risks. And that crisis never goes away for the nonprofit sector. It's a luxury to, to step back and say, well, now's not a good time. 
In the nonprofit sector, we can't do that. We need to get up every day and serve um, the most vulnerable of our of our society. And so from I was very, very fortunate to get some advanced uh, chapters of your book yes. and through your website, which is amazing. Um, and it is about understanding that that commitment to things that you might not see, but ultimately impact others in an incredible way. Um, it had to be personally devastating for you and your team to watch some of this work go, knowing all of these clients that you have are really that weekend. I mean, as you think about March 14th, that's, mm. that's such a kickoff weekend <laughs> for fundraising. It's, so huge. it's one of the so biggest. Huge. And then, yeah. and across the country and to look at those clients and say, I, we don't know what to do. How did that really transform you? Well, it transformed me, it transformed the company, and I think it transformed our customers and their donors. We all had to go about things in a different way. Mm -hmm. And so all the, ru the rules were just thrown away. And, it, and we basically had to all start from scratch. Now, the good news for us was we had actually helped nonprofits fundraise through crisis before or through disaster. Mm -hmm. So, but it was never on a global scale, it was always on a regional scale. So we had helped um, organizations, let's say in the Gulf states, um, overcome uh, hurricanes. And we had helped uh, organizations on the West Coast overcome the disasters of, of fires that got in the way of fundraising and fundraising events and help kind of push through that in terms of we have to get through that and we have to focus on what's important. We have to focus on continuing to fundraise while um, we were faced with these, these disasters that are happening around us. And it's, um, it's a monumental challenge, but we, one that we have to, to, to step up to. So again, to your question, I think it changed and transformed all of us, our way of thinking. And we threw all of our old ways of thinking out and we came up with new ways of thinking. And again, that's one of the inspiring things for me, uh, particularly with some of, of the customers and our donors. There's one organization that's focused on the homelessness cause. And it, in order to honor social distancing, but still had an in-person event, they had a night where they all slept in their cars as a fun, like as an in-person fundraising event where they all slept in their cars and they called it a night in the cold or something like that. And it was just those Amazing. types of stories that continue to inspire me, continue to inspire us to keep going um, mm -hmm. and, and just be, again, and be amazed at the different ways that people were using our software, our yeah. digital solutions to continue to fundraise. And as I said, uh, several hundred millions of dollars raised in the face of the global pandemic. It's just remarkable. You know, it's it's fascinating to me. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you with that fabulous book cover um, behind you. And I'm just inspired by that word fearless. And I find that so much of what we've been talking about this morning um, has revolved back to that core concept. Um, and I'd love in our final moments to chat with you about the concept of fear and risk, because it seems to me in our sector, even though we're doing the work of the angels, uh, we are damn stubborn when it comes to adopting new things, taking risk, and you're a technology company, you floated in that world. Um, why is it so hard for our sector to embrace technology? So I think, in a broader sense, it's how do people or what holds people back in terms of fear mm -hmm. and, 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 and to your point about risk taking. And, and I think that we, we all have to, I think, look at these challenges in a different, in a different way. And, and I think it's mindset. And what, what I like to and I call this kind of this, the, the secret to life. Mm -hmm. And the secret to life is one of these. Do tell, do tell. <laughs> <laughs> the secret to life is you can't, you can't control the outside factors that come to you. You can't control that. But what you can do in the next moment is decide what you're going to do next. And I think if we all know and embrace that, then we have no fear because I can't, I'm not going to worry about what's coming at me. I, I'm, I'm not going to 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 wring my hands about it. I'm not going to complain about it. I'm not going to say life's not fair. I'm right. just going to say, okay, that's coming at me. And I have no control over that, but I have 100% control on what I do next. 
And I think for me, that's what gives me the fearlessness to move forward, the fearlessness to say, I know what I need to do next. And, I, and I'm not going to worry about what's coming at me that I can't control, but I am going to focus on what I can control. And to me, that's the key. I love that. I think that is incredible wisdom, especially in the nonprofit sector where so many of us work in a crisis mode continuously. Yes. And it's very, very hard to think outside that present moment and to take um, reflection or time to um, slow our brains and our bodies enough to, to look forward. So I love that you said that. I think that's a, an incredible lesson. Now I got to ask this question. Okay. Would you have come up with this approach and this wisdom to being fearless without the pandemic? I would say, <laughs> it's like, oh, I, the panel. <laughs> I would say that, 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 and everyone who knows me Mm-hmm. knows I'm always looking for pandemic silver linings or COVID uh-huh, silver yeah. linings. Yeah. And so I would say that this is a silver lining that came with the pandemic. It was it was an opportunity for me to, to your point, to slow down a little bit mm-hmm. and, and communicate what I was thinking, communicate what I think others, to, to put that empathy hat on and, if, you know, and, and really put myself in someone else's shoes and say, I didn't have young kids at, at home, but I can only imagine what you're going through. I, I, I didn't have that, but, but to write about things like giving people back the gift of time through better time management and managing that matrix of urgent and important in a, in a way that they can give themselves the gift of time back. So I would say that, that, so many bad things came with the pandemic. So many bad things came with COVID. But one of the silver linings for me personally, and I think hopefully uh, for whoever buys Fearless, is that they can see the leadership lessons that we learned during the pandemic that we were able to, 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 to communicate. And like you said, take that time, that moment, um, and just realize that we can get through. We can get through this together. We have to be resilient in the face of all of the adversity that's coming at us. But again, my message was always, we got this and we're in it together. Yeah. Well, it has been a delight to have you on the nonprofit show today. I'm so honored that you would uh, take this time and and share with us your reflections. Um, One Cause is really an amazing organization. Just watching them from afar, seeing what they've been able to do, um, and it's it's been really cool, t- to be honest, to um, actually then find that nexus between you, your writing, and and the organization. Fearless um, is actually being printed right now, right? I mean, it's it's like coming yes. out really soon. <laughs> so so we're hoping to have it. Get it. <laughs> so if you go to fearlessfundraisers.com. You can, we're taking pre-orders again, Mm -hmm. fearlessfundraisers.com. Hopefully we'll have a link for that. We'll be taking pre-orders for that. And we hope to have physical copies of the book in time for the holiday season. Good. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. You know, um, from the advanced copy work that I was able to get, I've got to say, Steve, I think that this could be a really neat group read for a nonprofit Mm -hmm. C-suite or or an organization. And I would love to float that um, because I think that, it is the here and the now, it's the things that are going on. But at the end of the day, it's a structure and discussion about how we serve and, and how we deal with crisis. It's, it's uh, I think, a, a really great read. And I think it could be um, something that's really helpful for an organization to come together with, um, you know, reading a chapter a week or something like that, and then coming back to your team and discussing it might be one of those uh, amazing lessons. Um, so I'd really encourage our viewers and our listeners uh, to, to consider that because it's, it's, I'm very, very impressed. I really, really am. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Julia Patrick. I want to give my um, gratitude to Creighton University Medical School who's hosting us today at their amazing new campus um, based in Phoenix, Arizona. Again, the nonprofit show comes to you on behalf of so many of our wonderful partners, Bloomerang Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, your part-time controller, the nonprofit nerd, Be Generous, and Nonprofit Thought Leader. 
Again, these are the folks that come to, that allow us to come to you every day. We, Steve, we are coming up very closely on our 650th episode. Wow. So, which is amazing considering I witnessed to you, I thought this was a two week gig. So, <laughs> but anyway. Um, yes, congrats on that. Thank you. And congratulations on writing a book. That's damn hard. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me today. Hey, it's been great. Uh, remember, everybody, you can access our archives if you want to share this episode through Roku, Amazon Fire TV, YouTube, Vimeo, and we're now available on podcasts. So wherever you like to consume your content, cue us up, The Nonprofit Show, and you'll get to be able to hear um, from a lot of different thought leaders as we have today. I want to again thank everyone for joining us. Steve, I can't wait to hold that book in my hand. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks so much for joining the Nonprofit Show. We'll see you again tomorrow. And to remember for ourselves, our listeners, our viewers, our guests, to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you again, everyone.